So breathing is important behavior. Breathing is interesting behavior. Now I'm going to make a bold statement. Breathing is perhaps the first behavior that we may be able to understand its neural basis at genetic, molecular, cellular, and network levels of analysis. We may have the full package in the neural control of breathing. So I want to try and go down that path with you today and talk about some of the things we've learned over the past couple of decades. So let's start out by reviewing the breathing plan. So at the bottom of the slide here, we have the airways and the lungs. If we're going to understand the neural control and generation of breathing, we have to move from the breathing Plant. Yeah. Uh, can I interrupt you for a few things, Chris? Um, can yeah. everybody please mute? Uh, I don't know how two or three is, and I don't need to be here, but can you please mute? And if it's not muted, please mute. Yeah, yeah. Who's, who's two or three? Two or three. For me, that is the technical is mute, it's just it's hard to hear the background. Can I continue? Well, they haven't muted yet. I think, I think they may not know how to. Okay, so we have the breathing plant here. And this is the airways, the lungs, and um, in order to get at the neural generation and control of this behavior, we're going to have to get up into the brain somehow. So let's start by tracing the nerves that innervate the motor neurons for the breathing plant. So we have, we have the spinal and cranial motor neurons. Cranial motor neurons innervate the airways for controlling the resistance. And then spinal motor neurons, which control the pump muscles, such as predominantly the diaphragm. And then if we follow this link one, one higher, we can get to the circuits that generate the fundamental rhythm and the pattern for breathing movements. And that's the place that we are going to, sorry for today, um, understand the rhythm and pattern generating circuits of the brain stem. And we're going to try and answer two questions. Number one, which neurons generate the rhythm and the pattern, and how do they do it? With regard to which neurons, we're going to try and identify them genetically and physiologically. And when we address how, we're going to look at rhythmogenic mechanisms at the cellular network level, as well as how the output pattern is produced by specific classes of ion channels. So as we begin that process, I'm going to change the questions in the yellow box to a picture of a plethysmographic trace from an adult mouse. This shows the breathing pattern in a healthy, awake, intact mouse as the waveform moves up, that is inspiration, and as the waveform moves back down, that is expiration or exhale. Let me stipulate that inspiration is active and inexorable. Every breath must involve an active inspiration. Under resting conditions, the expiration or exhale can be passive, merely the recoil of the breathing plant itself. Now, it's possible for it to be active, and a lot of situations call for active expiration. But today, as I seek to understand the neural basis for inspiratory breathing movements, I'm just going to focus on active inspiration. Now, as we analyze these circuits, I want to stipulate that the signature of rhythm generation is the frequency between the breaths. So we're oftentimes going to look at the frequency of the breaths as a way to understand what's happening in the rhythm generator. And pattern generating circuits are going to be mostly recognized through effects on the amplitude of breathing movements and breathing rhythms. So frequency and amplitude are going to give us insights into rhythm generation and pattern generation. So where do we look for these processes and these networks? The site of inspiratory rhythmogenesis is a site in the lower brainstem called prebosomer complex. I'm certain most of you are familiar with this. I'm going to recap it very briefly. It's not my work. It's the work of Jeff Smith and Jack Feldman and colleagues. But it's good to review it as we begin our process of analyzing these circuits. The central neuraxis of a newborn rodent, a rat or a mouse, can be removed and maintained in vitro. And the neuraxis will retain a fundamental rhythm and motor pattern that pertain to breathing. So in the, foot, in, the, in, in, the, in the figure on this slide, I'm showing the activity of cranial and spinal motor neurons, which are largely synchronous during the inspiratory phase. So in vitro, one can retain the fundamental rhythm and motor pattern that underlies breathing. But the whole neuraxis is not necessary. In fact, the pons in the upper medulla can be lopped off. The cervical spinal cord can be lopped off. 
and retain a slice, a transverse slice of tissue less than a millimeter thick, which contains a complete microcircuit for breathing. And that, that demands that one has, that the slice of tissue contains the pre-boxing where the rhythm originates, as well as the microcircuit containing premotor neurons and hypoglossal motor neurons that innervate airway musculature. So the point I want to make here is that the pre complex is retained. That's the site of the inspiratory nerve. But a slice of tissue com contains a complete inspiratory microcircuit, which is suitable and, in fact, advantageous for studying pre function in vitro in the laboratory. And we're going to make great use of this preparation as we move forward in the talk. So let's get started. Let's identify the neurons that comprise the pre or core oscillator. And my team had been involved in this project for well over a decade. There was a, a, a world consortium involved in this project, and I collaborated extensively with Paul Gray then at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And the approach we took was one based on molecular genetics. So the slide here shows the organization of the developing neural tube, where we recognize that combinatorial codes of transcription factors give rise to canonical classes of interneurons in the developing spinal cord and hind brain. And these canonical classes of neurons can oftentimes be associated with very specific functions, and we sought to find the ones that were involved in respiratory rhythm generation. And after a lot of screening, our group and, and other groups came to the conclusion that a promising class of neurons was those that, that were derived from embryonic cells that express the transcription factor DBX1. And in spinal cord terms, this is, this is the V0 population. So why did we become interested in DBX1 neurons? I'm going to summarize it very briefly. Number one, DBX1 neurons are rhythmically active in vitro. So here's a slice preparation. This is an intersectional mouse genetic model where we've used a DBX tree animal crossed with a fluorescent reporter that expresses T is male. So that made all DBX1 neurons glow red. We made patch clamp recordings from these neurons, and we found that they were rhythmically active in sync with the respiratory rhythm in vitro. Okay, so that's a good starting point. At least they're rhythmically active in sync with respiration in vitro. The second thing was that the DBX1 knockout mice did not breathe at all. So again, a necessary condition for DBX1 neurons to be important in respiratory rhythm generation, but not proof yet. So here's the third piece of evidence that got us really interested in these neurons. DBX1 neurons express all the peptides and peptide receptors that are known to modulate respiration. Furthermore, DBX1 neurons in the hindbrain are predominantly glutamatergic. We know that was necessary for them to be involved in respiratory rhythm generation from a lot of preceding studies over many decades. And they are commissural, that is, they cross the midline, connecting the preboxular complex on both sides of the brainstem. Again, that's necessary because breathing, unlike, for example, locomotion, is bilaterally synchronous. So DBX1 neurons have all the properties seem to be necessary for respiratory rhythm generation. So we proposed the DBX1 core hypothesis. That is that DBX1 neurons comprise the preboxing or core. And this has two very simple straightforward predictions. First, that stimulating them should speed up or accelerate breathing, and that um, silencing or killing them should slow down or stop breathing. So we tested these predictions, and we did these with in vivo experiments and equivalent in vitro experiments. But I'm only going to show you the in vivo experiments today because the both sets of experiments gave us the same answer, and in the interest of, of time, I'm just going to show you the in vivo ones. So to test the first prediction in, in vivo, we used our DBX1 tree mouse. And we crossed it with a, um, a reporter mouse that expresses channel rhodopsin, but only after cleaving two stop codons that precede channel rhodopsin. So the LOX P flank stop codon could be cleaved by the tree of the tree mouse, but the FRET flank stop codon needed to be cleaved by the local injection of a FLIPO expressing virus, and that would limit channel rhodopsin expression to the preboxner complex. So the resulting offspring mouse. It was not a green mouse, but in fact, the DBX1 derived neurons would be expressing GFP and thus be green, but they would also have channel adopsin that we could use to photostimulate them. So now I'm going to show you the photostimulation experiment. So here's a video. This animal 
is lightly sedated, so its eyes are open, and it's lightly sedated, so he's not going to move around. We can get good reporting from him. And let's start. Um, you'll see when we, um, the, the green light comes on that the channel reduction is being stimulated. You'll be able to see the animal move um, breathing, and breathing movements are visible. Just pay attention to the breathing. Okay, so hopefully the, the video made it very obvious that the animal's breathing movement is sped up. Now I'm going to try and show you some traces so that you can see it um, in, in terms of a figure that we can analyze a little bit better. So here are breathing traces in, from plethysmography at three different levels of channel reduction stimulation. And in all cases, the breathing rhythm speeds up, and that was what we predicted, but we saw something that we did not predict, and that is that the breathing movements also got larger. The amplitude of the, of, the, of, of, of the breaths got bigger. So they sped up and they got bigger. So photostimulating this population both sped up the rhythm and increased the amplitude. So let's hold on to that observation and go to the next prediction. So the second one was that silencing or killing DDX1 neurons should perturb, slow down, or stop the breathing. So we used our same pre mouse, but in this case, we crossed it with an archaeorhodopsin expressing Mouse. And archaeorhodopsin is photoactivatable, but in this case it's inhibitory rather than stimulatory. The reporter mice would express green neurons that also have archaeorhodopsin that we could use to inhibit neurons in the index one neurons in the reboxyrhodopsin. So let's start by looking at this experiment in the video again. Same setup, this is an animal that's lightly sedated and has um, uh, optrodes. Uh, Parked in the preboxner complex bilaterally. Now, let's start the video. We want you to pay attention to the breathing movements when the yellow light comes on. So there's almost a complete arrest of breathing movements. Over the 30 seconds that the light was on, the animal took two small breaths, which is pretty shocking given that mice normally breathe at about 3 to 3.5 hertz. So now let's look at that experiment in traces again. Same setup as last time. When the yellow light comes on, the breathing rhythm slows down. But just like in the last experiment, we also saw this concomitant decrease in the amplitude. So the breathing rhythm slowed down but the amplitude of the breathing movements also decreased, and that was not predicted. So we came to the conclusion that it appears as though the DVX1 neurons are affecting both rhythm and amplitude. There's one more experiment I want to share with you. This one involves laser ablation. So we used our multi-photon microscopy system to map out the DVX1 neurons in the three box complex in three dimensions, and then we stored the locations of DVX1 neurons as a three-dimensional map of targets. Then after that, we turned up the um, strength of the, of the ultra-fast laser, and we used it as a destroying, an ablating device. So in this experiment, we measure the amplitude of the respiratory rhythm and the period. Then we kill a DVX1 neuron, and then we measure the amplitude and period again. And that way, we can functionally disassemble the network and monitor its functionality in real time. So now let me show you the output of this experiment. So in the beginning, this is an, the x-axis is time. At the top, I show the amplitude of the hypoglossal nerve output. And on the bottom, I show the periodicity, or the cycle time, for the respiratory rhythm. And what we noticed in these experiments was that there's an immediate and precipitous decrease in the amplitude of motor output, and then an increase in period, which is a frequency decrease, until the laser ablations ultimately stop the respiratory rhythm not be recovered. So everything in the experiments that I showed you suggests that DVX1 neurons can affect both the rhythm and the amplitude. So the question we began to ask ourselves was, can we unravel these two functions on rhythm and pattern? So we sought to do this. And to do that, we looked back in the literature to try and find some clues. And we, we really took a lot of uh, clues from a study published by Jens Reckland where after making recordings 
from the prebiosmer complex. He suggested that neurons in the prebiosmer complex fall into two camps. The first he called type 1, and he suggested that these could be rhythmogenic. Why are they rhythmogenic? Type 1 neurons show a lot of pre-inspiratory activity, several hundred milliseconds before the inspiratory burst. And what was also interesting about type 1 neurons is that they express a potassium A current, and they never express a hypopolarization activated H current. On the other hand, there are type 2 neurons, which are putatively output related neurons. They show no pre-inspiratory activity, and then the diametrically opposite expression of intrinsic currents. They never express A current, but they do express an H current. And these neurons appear to fall discreetly within one of these two camps and not some intermediate phenotype between them. And what we brought to this story, and beginning in around uh, 2010, this is work I did with Maria Cristina Picardo, and we're followed up in the lab now. We have some studies right up about ready. We found that DVX1 neurons fit these type 1 and type 2 profiles very neatly. And we use this idea that perhaps the type 1 neurons are the rhythmogenic ones and the type 2 neurons are output related. So let's talk about the logic of the microcircuit. We know that the preboxmer complex is located ventrally in the medulla and that our signature for motor output, which is the hypoglossal nucleus, which normally innervates the genioglossus and the airways, is located in the dorsal medial component. And between them is the reticular formation, which is a mixed area. There's a lot of functions going on in the reticular formation, but one of the known functions is that it contains premotor neurons for the hypoglossal nucleus. So we hypothesize that between the DVX1 rhythmogenic neurons in the preboxmer complex and the hypoglossal motor neurons, which are not DVX1 derived, might be a discrete population of DVX1 derived premotor neurons, which would be in the dorsal prebotsmer complex or within the reticular formation. So we sought to test this. And this is work I did in collaboration with Greg Funk at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And the lead investigator at the time was Ann Revel, who was working with Greg at the time, but she now has her own lab at Midwestern University. So in this collaboration, we sought to find whether there were specialized DVX1 output related neurons that could be premotor to the hypoglossal nucleus. So we made some recordings in the dorsal preboxer complex and in the reticular formation, and we found predominantly type 2 phenotype neurons consistent with an output. And then we tested to see what. So, sorry to interrupt that. Okay. Yep. I, I used to work with Cliff Saker, who didn't let us use the term reticular formation because he was going to anatomic specificity. Do you know what exactly that center is? We, we did some work on some of the color regions. Do you know what that is anatomically? So the recordings that we did were all very close to the dorsal edge of the prebotsmer complex, and I've never really called it anything other than the dorsal prebotsmer complex. Okay. So I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm sorry. Is it cholinergic or direct? These are DVX1 derived neurons, so they're glutamatergic. They're not cholinergic. Okay. That we did verify with in situ hybridization. Yes. So we are not talking about cholinergic, GABAergic, or glycinergic neurons. All of these recordings are from DVX1 derived cells. We know they're DVX1 derived because we always use the porter mice with a DVX tree animal being crossed with a TD tomato fluorescent reporter. So they're for sure glutamatergic cells. So after identifying the neuron through TD tomato expression, we made these recordings. They were type 2. And then we tested to see whether they could be connected to the hypoglossal nucleus. So we could introduce orthodromic stimulation through the patch electrode, but we also dropped the stimulating electrode into the hypoglossal nucleus to provide antidromic stimulation. An antidromic shock through the hypoglossal electrode evoked an action potential in the recorded neuron. Not surprising, or perhaps surprising, but pretty standard technique. And then if we had an orthodromic stimulation patch electrode, and we followed with an antidromic stimulation 25 milliseconds later, we could of course evoke both an orthodromic and an antidromic spike. But when we made the two orthodromic and antidromic stimuli within 5 milliseconds, the antidromic stimulation failed to generate an action potential, presumably because of a collision with the orthodromic spike. And this gave us some assurance 
that these type 2 neurons in the dorsal prevoxular complex, which are DBX1 derived, were in fact connecting directly to hypoglossal motor neurons in the hypoglossal nucleus, thus um, verifying our, our prediction. So the hypothesis was that DBX1 neurons can also be premotor neurons and can influence the hypoglossal neurons in their output. So the testable prediction here would be killing DBX1 neurons in the dorsal prevoxular complex and the reticular formation and seeing whether it would perturb the hypoglossal output but not affect the frequency. So that is, could we kill these neurons and have it just affect the amplitude? So for this, we dusted off our laser ablation technique, but we changed it up a little bit. Instead of deleting neurons within the preboxmer complex, we moved our target detection and our ablation zone to the dorsal regions just immediately to the preboxmer complex. And I won't call it that reticular thing. I won't, I won't use that terminology. So we changed the target detection zone and the ablation zone. And we also only applied the technique unilaterally so that each slice, if it were to put it for both nerve rootlets, would be its own control. So here's the experiment. Only ablating on the right-hand side decreased the motor output on the right. It had no effect on the left. And indeed, the cycle period was not affected either, suggesting that we were ablating predominantly a premotor population and not a rhythmogenic. So, here's the take-home message. DBX1 neurons have rhythmogenic and pattern-related functions. Our working model is that the premotor neurons are type 2 in their physiological properties, and they probably map to the B0D genetic population. The DBX1 rhythmogenic neurons have a type 1 electrophysiological phenotype, and they probably map to the B0V genetic So let's move to rhythmogenic mechanisms now. And we're going to talk about first loop theory. So I'm going to try and explain first loop theory to you graphically with the following picture. And this, this is an idea that emerged from Highland Cam's work with Jack Feldman and starting in about 2013. So the idea of first loop theory is this, that the rhythm that emerges from the prebotsmer complex is actually sub-threshold from the standpoint of motor output that the burstlet is a sub-threshold burst, which represents the network interactions among excitatory neurons in the prebotsmer complex, and that occasionally, when the burstlet reaches a threshold, then it generates an inspiratory burst, and that provides the output for inspiratory bursts and motor output. The rhythmogenic mechanism is here within the prebotsmer complex locally, with burstlets and their interburst intervals. But when the burstlet reaches its threshold, we refer to it as pre-I, or pre-inspiratory activity, and it gives rise to a burst, which then is the motor output. So the burst is essential for breathing, but the burstlets are essentially rhythmogenic. Now here I've used cyan blue to indicate burstlets and rhythmogenesis, and red to indicate bursts and motor output. And I'm going to try and stick with this color scheme for the remainder of the talk. Rhythmogenic properties are going to be blue, first outputs are going to be red. So the first thing that we did when we addressed first the theory was to see if we could replicate what Kylan Camp published in 2013. And this is work I did with my very talented graduate student, Project a Colored Car. We tried to essentially replicate every experiment that they did, and we found exactly the same results. So here I'm showing the slice recording where we're making a field recording from the pre complex with a typical nerve output recording from the hypoglossal nerve. And when the conditions are high excitability, we saw very few burstlets. There was just one here shown with the, the blue asterisk. Mostly we saw bursts in motor output. However, when we lowered the excitability, bursts in motor output became more rare, and burstlets became more plentiful. And so we quantified this, and I'll show you in the plot at the bottom. At high levels of, of excitability, burstlets are rare. There's mostly bursts in output. But as excitability gets lower, which we can modulate through external potassium concentration, then burstlets become much more plentiful. So we replicated this study, but could those burstlets just be spurious? Well, to test this, we then recorded bilaterally. And what we found was that, not surprisingly, bursts in motor output were always bilaterally synchronous in the preboxone complex. But what surprised us was that the burstlets were also bilaterally synchronous which suggested that bursts were not spurious activity 
but in fact were coordinated activity on a whole cast of the Bodstrom compass, which would be consistent with it being a rhythmogenic mechanism. So is this rhythmogenic? In order to address that, we did some cycle triggered averages. So the first thing that I'm showing you here is, a, is an average of 10 verselets, and we see the average trajectory of the verselets. And now superimposed on that is a cycle triggered average of activity that resulted in an inspiratory burst. What you'll notice is that the trajectory of the burstlet and the pre-inspiratory phase of the burst are almost identical, suggesting that the burstlet is consistent with the pre-inspiratory phase of the burst. And when that motor output is present, when the burst is present, you get motor output first, and the motor output occur after the burst takes place. So this is the idea that burstlets are underlying the pre-inspiratory So what's the mechanism? We did some burstlet recordings in combination with intracellular recordings from DBX1-derived neurons in the preboxone complex. And what we saw was summation of EPSPs. Very interesting work by Sufyan Ashad suggests that this also has to do with synchronization of EPSPs. But for a moment, I'll just talk about summation. The summation of the PSPs is clear from the trajectory shown at the top half of the slide. What's clearly not present is a pacemaker-like current, which would result in a rapid upswing in the voltage. That's not present. What we clearly see here are summation and probably synchronization of EPSPs, but not voltage-dependent pacemaker currents. Again, consistent with the idea that these are network properties and synaptic interactions locally within the preboxone complex. So that was one recording, one patch lab recording. The next thing we did in my lab was to make some multi-photon recordings and look at what multiple neurons in the preboxone are doing at the same time. So here I am showing you just five neurons. Normally we record dozens of neurons at the same time, but for ease of display, I've just included five neurons and the hypoglossal nerve. Out. Blue highlights, which are units two, three, and five, are generating both the bursts and also the bursts. And neurons one and four are just involved at bursts, in bursts. And these are under high excitability conditions. So now let's lower excitability and see what happens. So now under low excitability conditions, what we still see is that units two, three, and five are involved in bursts and burstlets, and units one and three are involved in bursts. This suggests to us that a neuron's participation in bursts versus burstlets does not depend on excitability conditions, but appears to be an intrinsic property of the neuron itself. Consistent with this idea that there are two discrete classes of neurons in the preboxone some of which are rhythmogenic, and they generate burstlets, and some of which may be related to patterning and output, in which case they would only be involved in bursts. So the take-home message for rhythmogenesis is that burstlet hypothesis is a viable explanation for respiratory rhythmogenesis, and not other explanations that might involve pacemaker neurons or synaptic inhibition. In fact, burstlet hypothesis is a viable explanation. And that there appear to be two populations of neurons in the preboxone complex, one which is concerned with rhythm generation, and that is the electrophysiological phenotype is type 1, and the second that is involved in output is probably type 2, and these may be genetically related to P0E and P0E neurons. That remains to be continued to investigate. So now let's talk about output. I want to understand the ion channels that underlie inspiratory bursts as a mechanism to understand output and patterning mechanisms. So I'm going to put on the screen now three cycles of respiratory activity in vitro recorded from a type 1 DBX1 neuron in the preboxone complex. And let's look at let's look at this pattern and try to understand what's happening. So the first part of the cycle here is what I just described to you as pre-inspiratory activity. Now, because it reaches threshold and generates a burst, it is pre-inspiratory activity. But I put in parentheses burst because our understanding is that the underlying mechanism is a burst. Lift. Now, during this pre-inspiratory phase, when the neurons are generating action potentials, calcium is accumulating within them. And that calcium, as it accumulates, is able to then activate a CAN current. CAN refers to calcium activated, but sodium mediated. That is, calcium opens the channels but sodium is the charge carrier. That's a can current that gives rise to this burst. Following the inspiratory burst, it activates sodium-potassium ATP, 
PCAs pumps, which are electrogenic, and produce an outward current. And then there's also synaptic depression that helps bring the inspiratory curves to the end. And of course, this is followed by another pre-inspiratory phase. But what I want to focus on now is the activation of the CAN current, because that appears to generate this very strong burst, which is associated with output. So CAN current is phenomenological. It refers to a whole cell current. It is not itself an ion channel. So in order to investigate the CAN current and its role in output, the first task was to identify the underlying ion channels. So again, we went to molecular genetics to try and unravel this question, and we did RNA sequencing. And this was a large effort that involved many faculty members at William and Mary, including my, my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Saha and Dr. Karate Smith, as well as a team of graduate students and undergraduate students. And we did RNA sequencing in the preboxomer complex and constructed the transcriptome of both DBX1 neurons and non DBX1 neurons. And I'm just showing you a heat map of 16 of the 27 trip channels that were expressed. We thought it would be most likely that the CAN current results from a transient receptor potential ion channel, or trip channel. And only 16 of the 27 were expressed in our, in our samples. And so we used reasoning to try and eliminate those trip channels that would be involved in temperature sensation, or those that would be calcium currents, those that would have the wrong conductance size, or be involved in store-operated channels. And I don't have the luxury of time to take you through all of those screening experiments, so let me just cut to the chase and say we were able to reasonably eliminate all the candidates except these two, trip C3 and trip M4, because both of those channels can be activated by intracellular calcium, but sodium is the predominant charge carrier, so they seem like the best candidates. And in the following studies that I'm going to describe for you, we investigated both trip C3 and trip M4, but we found that one of them was a far better candidate for CAN current than the other. So I'm, for the next few slides, just going to focus on the trip M4 experiments. So here's how we tested the role of trip M4 and the CAN current in breathing output patterns. So first, we looked in vitro to see if the channels were there. The transcriptome said it was, but we needed to do some histochemistry to verify that. On the left, I'm showing you a transverse section where magenta is DBX1 cells. And on the right-hand side is a blow-up of the, of the dotted line region where cyan now shows trip M4 expression. And I'm going to focus on the cellular level and show you that DBX1 neurons indeed express the trip M4 ion channels this up at the So this suggests that it's a viable candidate it's expressed in the right class of neurons. So then we sought to test it. And here's how we did it. We designed a short hairpin RNA experiment to silence trip M4 gene expression. The way this technique works is the following. We have a packaging adeno-associated virus which contains a vector with short hairpin RNA. It gets into the cell nucleus express the viral DNA, and then the short hairpin RNA complex produces short, uh, small inhibitory RNAs, which then act to degrade and destroy the RNA selectively for trip M4 and make it non-functional. Okay, so this is a good schematic. Perhaps it's a nice diagram. Does it actually work? So the first thing we did after designing this approach was to see whether it actually worked. At day zero, we injected 12 mice unilaterally with short pin RNA against trip M4. And on the other side, unilaterally we got shRNA. On the other side, we gave a scrambled vector. The same nucleotides are present, but we shuffled their order so they don't actually target any gene. So each animal is its own control. And then we sacrificed three mice at the time points shown here in order to measure trip M4 trip M4 gene and protein expression. And I'm going to show you the Western blots for protein expression. So here are the experiments. All 12 mice are along the x-axis here into four discrete times, day 10, 20, 30, and 40. And at the farthest right-hand side shows you the signal in Western blots for trip M4 expression. And it declines relatively exponentially to a decline of ultimately more than 60%. So with shRNA, by 40 days post-injection, 
were able to depress driven for expression by 60%. So what impact does this have on the behavior? So let's go with that. Let's go and look at that now. I'm going to show you breathing patterns in awake, intact adult mice following the injection of shRNA targeted to trip M4. These are lepismography experiments. Here's the baseline breathing activity. Inspiration is up. And by day nine and two weeks after the experiments, we noted a decrease in the tidal volume of the breaths, suggesting some impact on the output pattern. And by one month after injection, we noticed gasps and ataxia in the breathing pattern of our cohort of shRNA injected animals. And by day 37 of the study, more than half of the participants in these mice had died of respiratory failure, suggesting that the knockdown of trypan 4 had an impact on the pattern, the output, and that ultimately the failure to be able to generate the proper pattern caused severe ataxia and respiratory failure. 